All righty, guys. Joining us now on the line is a gentleman that I considered an honor and a privilege to have on the show. Somebody that I can't believe it's taken us as long as it has to get on the show. There's a true legend in the world of professional wrestling, and I'm hoping a 2011 WWE Hall of Famer, the one and only Sir Oliver Humperdinck. Sir, are you still with us? I am indeed. Good uh, to be with you. It's great to have you on the show, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Well, it's my pleasure. All righty. So uh, coming up real soon, you got uh, actually it's coming up in the first week of August. It looks like August 5th through the 8th. Yep. It's the NWA Legends Fest weekend, and uh, I'm sure that uh, a lot of the guys are getting together. I've, I've read the roster that they have, and this is one of the more impressive rosters they've had in recent years. Yeah, it's a great, great lineup. Uh, it's going to be held in Charlotte, North Carolina, like you said, the weekend of August 5th through 8th. Uh, if you've never been, geez, I'm, you're missing something. You've got to come down and check it out. If you've been before, there's nothing I have to say to you, you know, because, uh, you know, there's people that have been to, I think this is a eighth one. There's people that have been to every one of them. Yeah. They, they, they come won. back year after year and make fr friends, and, uh, you know, it's a great time. I'm, I'm really, really, really pleased to be a part of it. And uh, Greg uh, Price down there in Charlotte does a wonderful job. Absolutely. It's a... Uh... You know, you get everything there. You get all your, you get to meet all these legendary figures of professional wrestling, as well as there's a lot of great vendors there too. You can buy some really rare merchandise that you're not going to get anywhere else. So, I mean, it's you know, really you're talking about just le legends, but there's a lot of guys from the current scene that are going to be there. Like uh, Phil Shatter's going to be there. Mm -hmm. He's got a big wrestling show too. Uh, Chase Stevens will be there. Caprice Coleman, uh, Roughhouse Ryan O'Kelly. So it's a mixture of. Uh, the legends of the sport, and the present-day stars of the sport. And how do you like getting out there and getting to, to see the guys again that you maybe managed back in the day or were around back in the day? Oh, it's wonderful. It's, it's really wonderful. It's uh, a chance for us to get together. Like you say, we spent so much of our lives together, uh, either traveling or sitting in dressing rooms or in the ring. You know, it's it's good to see everybody after a long time and, with these guys, it's like just picking it up like you saw them yesterday, you know? And a lot of fans that, that saw, you know, your WWF stuff might not realize that you spent almost 30 years in our crazy business. Absolutely, yeah. I was with the NWA um, most of that time and also with WCW and then uh, a rather short stint with WWE, but pleasant nonetheless. Pleasant nonetheless, and, and exactly, and... It's really a shame that a lot of people remember, I don't know if it's because of WWE 24-7 or things like that, but when I've announced that you were going to come on the show, a lot of people talked about your managing Bam Bam Bigelow and your time in the yes. WWF, and my thoughts is, you know, when I hear Oliver Humperdinck, the first thing I think of is Gordon Soley's voice announcing you. Yeah, exactly. I spent a lot of time with Gordon uh, down in the Florida area for Eddie Graham. Uh, first time I was down there was like 1974, and off and on throughout the years, you know, it was kind of like a home base for me, you know. Sure. I go other places, but I'd always end up back in Florida. You did, and, and that seemed to be, you know, I, I just recently, uh, I'm flipping a lot of my old tapes over to DVD and things that I taped when I was coming up and, and really growing up and really loving this stuff. And I've been watching some of the Battle of the Belt stuff that you were on, and I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's great to look back and really take a look at the legendary times uh, of the business, and especially Florida. For those who didn't see it, Florida was so far ahead of its time. For what Florida was a great territory. Oh, yeah. They had they had a virtual who's who of the wrestling business that ran through there at one time or another. Every big name you can think of, you know. And uh, Eddie was a brilliant guy to work for. He uh, was a you know he, he had a great mind for wrestling. He wasn't formally educated or anything like that, but he knew the wrestling business uh, backwards and forwards, inside and out. So much so that other promoters would call Eddie. If they got stuck for an idea or something or painted themselves into a corner, they call Eddie to untangle the mess they got themselves into. Now you were around all the great promoters. You were around uh, Vern Gagne when you were for AWA early, early on, mm -hmm. the, uh, Vince McMahon and all them. Eddie has to be considered one of the um, brighter of, the, of all those guys in terms yeah, of... Yeah, I don't think all. anybody, and nobody could have touched Eddie. Nobody? Eddie was the smartest man I've ever been around in the business. Learned a lot from him. That's what another reason I enjoyed uh, going. I was going back there was to work with Eddie and be around him and see how he'd do things and that. You know, I was a tremendous fan of Eddie Graham as well. How about Mike Graham? How did you get along with Mike? Mike and I always got along well. Very cool. 
Yeah, Mike is a good guy. I see him at different shows nowadays, you know, and and uh, we've got a good relationship. We always had. We never had a problem. Very good, very good. Now, when you went to the WWF, it was the height of when all the best talent, it seemed, were being one person's invasion is another person's acquisition and all that other, whatever kind of euphemism you want to put on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were bringing in the the brightest talent that they saw on the scene and really recruiting a lot of them. Did you consider yourself to be blessed to be one of those uh, talents that they chose to come up? Well, they called me. Yeah. I didn't call them. Uh, they called me. I was uh, in Minneapolis. I, would, I had just finished somewhere and before I started someplace else. And I was home in Minneapolis, and they were doing a TV. I believe it was in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And they asked me to be there. They had a guy for me. I'd never met uh, Bigelow before, and he wanted me to take a look at him and see what I thought and put us together eventually. So I made the trip down to uh, Madison, and we did the TV. And uh, it was called the Battle for Bam Bam is what it was. And they had all the different managers trying to uh, to represent him. And finally, at the end, he called me out, and that started a pretty good relationship with Very Scott. Cool. And, and unfortunately, of course, everybody knows in the past uh, decade we lost Bam Bam. Yeah, yeah, I really miss the guy. I mean, he was a great guy and uh, very, very talented. Uh, did a lot of amazing things in the ring, you know. I don't think to this day there's anybody that uh, took the bumps and took the uh, – did the maneuvers that the big man did, you know? Not really, no. But he was uh, he was a great guy, and I miss him very, very much. I do stay in touch with his uh, ex-wife and his kids. So, you know, I, I, I try to stay in touch the best I can. Excellent. Now, well, I miss it, Scott a great deal. It, there was a big departure, though, from your Florida days to your WWF days, is that in that you were a baby face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know, you know. I, I think if they would have brought us in first as heels and let us get over first as heels and then did the switch, I think we would have been a lot more over than we were, you know. I think that would have worked better. I mean, Bam Bam had the look that could scare some kids. So if we Yeah, he had the look, and, and of course I do too, you know. <laughs> I got a face with sour milk. <laughs> the face for radio, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it was a little, uh, it was a little back-ass word as far as I was concerned, but... Wow! Uh, just, I guess they had a position. They had a position for a baby face at the time, and they figured Scott would fit it. But uh, I think you, you know, I, I'm proud of what we did there. We had a great run, you know, team with Hogan and all that. You can't get any higher. Survivor Series, right? right. Well, not only Survivor Series, but all around with DiBiase and the Giant, and yeah, I think DiBiase you did, uh, and Madison Virgil. Garden show too, where you guys sure, play. absolutely, all over the horn, you know. So, uh, you know, that was a thrill too. You know, uh, working with Hogan and being on top of Madison Square Garden and things like that. So, you so it with... wasn't, you know, I don't look at the time as uh, in any bitterness at all. It was a great time. I was uh, very happy to be there, and uh, I just wish we could have extended the run a little bit. Now, Bam Bam came into WCW, and uh, you did one, I think you did one off with them at Starcade. Yes. Did you enjoy uh, getting back together, and was there any hope that that would be something that would last a, a while? Well, actually, we did go in, into the territory thinking we were going to stay a while. Huh. And that's when uh, when Scott had the uh, uh, knee operations and that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the Starcade, uh, that was a match with Barry Windham, correct? That's correct, yep. You were yeah, there, yeah, that was a terrific match. People still talk about that one. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't just a one other thing. We were just going to, we were going to go in there and work, you know. But as it turns out, uh, Scott needed surgery on his, on his knees and... Uh, and that's why we didn't stay around that long. Now, in 93, you retired, am I correct? Yeah, I think it was late 92, 93, yeah. What made you decide to give it up? Well, I always told myself, James, that I would be in the wrestling business as long as it was fun. And during that time, there was a lot of chaos going on. WCW, I was working for. Uh, you know, it was post Jim Hurd era, but I was there for that too. And it was just not fun for me anymore. It was, it was, it had become a job. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I can. Uh, the dressing rooms weren't the same. Uh, instead of everybody working for the good of the territory, guys were worried about their own deals, you know, and all of them are hanging their head down and 
it was just a really unpleasant place to be, you know. You always want to try to feel the best you can in the dressing room. That's your little home away from home, you know. But it got so at the end that uh, it was just not the same. You think and, that had to do uh, with just less places to go or that the guys got more competitive? And- no, I don't think so. They were tossing around big bucks, you know. Everybody's worried about their merchandise sales. Uh, somebody was asked to do a job, they'd, you know, hang their head and mope and, you know, hmm. you know, they're, they're all, they were all concerned instead of being part of a team trying to draw, they're always o- only worried about their individual positions and not thinking of the team because it didn't matter if you drew or not. You got that money every week, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And that's what, uh, I've had plenty of guests on the show jokingly say, you know, you don't get paid more if you win the match. So. No, no, it's the same deal. You know, I, you know, uh, even the even the Yankees get beat. Exactly. Yeah. What can you, what can you say? You know, and this is what the business is all about. And uh, if you can't handle losing, you don't belong in the business. Precisely. And that, I mean, that's what people say that some of the guys have become marks for the business. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, you know, there's been circumstances. You know. In my career, and I'm sure other guys will tell you the same thing, that you'll put a baby face over for three or four shows in a row, and then it comes time for him to do the honors, and you know, he, look, he looks like you, you know, he looks at you like you just farted or something, you know. You understand what I'm saying? You've done everything to get this guy over, put him over like three times in a row, and then finally it's your turn to do whatever, grab the tights or grab the ropes, whatever, and beat the guy, and he looks at you like, uh, you know can't be actually asking me to do a job. Crazy. Now, the business changed a lot of ways, and one of the most obvious one was the uh, change in the, the role of the manager. Um, after you left, uh, obviously, a lot of the girls came in, and it became more of a you know bikini contest. Behind yeah, what the, the hell was my timing on that? <laughs> why, couldn't, why couldn't I be around when the divas were there? <laughs> I mean, it seemed to me that for the longest time, everybody used to say, well, the only manager left was uh, Father James Mitchell. James Mitchell. Yeah. And unfortunately, he's not really doing it as much as he used to either. Yeah, the, is, the only place to see it now is on the indies, you know. And what do you think of that? Is, is, that seems to me it's a shame. Well, it is a shame because it added another dimension and another uh, element of excitement to a uh, confrontation, you know. Just the mere thought of the guy being at Rinse Springside and you know he's, deep down a dirty rat and uh the anticipation of of actually getting physically involved was always there so i think it i think it's taken a lot away from the uh from the you know just the all around ambience of the angle of the match you know well and not only that though but it was also a good way to introduce characters like when you had the house of humperdinck you could oh, bring exactly, a guy in. Yeah. Yeah, you could bring exactly. a guy in, and immediately they hated him because he was associated with you. Yeah, the same way with Gary Hart, you know, or other managers that did the thing. Uh, it was, you know, you, you being the manager, had a certain amount of heat, and anybody that they would put with you would glean that heat right off of you, and be in a position where, well, people figured, well, if he's with Humperdinck, he must be pretty good, you know. Okay. So uh, yeah, it did. It did uh, help guys with uh, getting over in a territory, just coming in cold and out. If they put him with me, well, that they, they knew he was an unscrupulous individual. You know. There you go. So, I mean, the problem I always had with the, with the women being managers, though, and, and taking over the role of managers, is that most of them you couldn't hit, you couldn't bump. They could. They couldn't. You know, there was no payoff to their being <clears> the heel. And I mean, yeah. the thing was with you, you know, you, you would take a bump and Bobby Heenan. Place to come and glue. You know? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I I understand exactly what you're saying, and I agree wholeheartedly. You know, but I I hesitated even calling them managers. You know, I think I think they could be uh, valets or something like that. But the girls never did, uh, other than Sherry. Now Sherry was an exception. Yeah, she's an exception. Sensational. Yeah. God bless her. I miss her so very much. But she was a good friend and. Uh, she was probably the closest thing to a, a guy manager that the girls ever had uh, before that or after that, you know. I remember when uh, she took bumps from the Ultimate Warrior, and Ooh. I bet you those really did hurt. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they did, but Sherry was a trooper, you know. Absolutely. She'd, uh, she'd, you know, say, bring it on, you know. She was a great gal. Did you ever meet her? I did interview her, yes. I interviewed her. In she was a terrific gal. 
Yeah, I got to tell you, I mean, we sat down, we talked for for a long period of time, and very nice person. I talked to her unfortunately in 2007, just a few months before she had passed. Yeah, we were trying to set something up, and for whatever reason, it just never we never got together and did it, and it just never happened. And right, right. That's one of the regrets that uh, my wife and I have in the business is because she found her again for me to do another one, and yeah, we just yeah. never. She was wonderful. She was as tough as nails, too, man. She'd she'd fight if there was a problem at ringside. She'd fight right right alongside you, you know. And she looked good too. You can't take that away. From well, her. hey, she wasn't bad on the eyes. I'll tell you that. Not really. There you go. So makeup here was kind you are now. <coughs> Sorry. Makeup was kind of scary, though. The makeup, yeah. Well, oh well, she tried to look scary then. You know, she was scary, <laughs> Sherry. Yeah. But she was a beautiful gal. She yeah, was she a, was. a a good looking gal. And a good worker, too. Absolutely, but, yeah. She was, she was uh, one of the best, absolutely. So here we are in 2010, and you're on Facebook, and you're posting. i, I got to say, I really do enjoy your updates with your uh, the early days of rock and roll and, blue, and rhythm and blues uh, updates and things like that. Well, thank you. I, I do enjoy this this day in history that you post. and It reminds me of another guy who uh, actually worked for the AWA as well. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. I'm sure he'll probably be appearing at some of the uh, Legends Fest, not all of them. And that is a former AWA and WCW announcer, Lee Marshall. Lee Marshall, yeah. You know, I never worked with Lee. Uh, he was up here for Vern, and I was elsewhere, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I had met Lee a couple times, and he was a pretty good guy. He's Did you know he's the voice, voice of Tony the Tiger? I was just about to say that, yeah. For Kellogg's now, yeah. And do you know what he also does, though, that I thought you might, you guys might hit it off? Well, yeah, he's got an oldie rock and roll show out there in he's L.A. He's got an oldie rock and roll show, and he also helps program a lot of the ones across the country. Yeah, 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 I did know that, yeah. So I thought that, that you guys would probably get along pretty well. Well, you know, mine is more geared to... Uh, to blues rather than rock. Well, it all it all springs from the same source. It does. It you does. know, so it's hard to really uh, say it's just strictly blues, but it's heavy emphasis on blues with, uh, you know, everything that it, it encompasses right around it, you know. And do you feel that that, um, that musical influence, which obviously you've had all your life, do you think that, that kind of came into fruition on your uh, wrestling side of things? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, it... Uh, I was I always was uh, uh, a blues fan, you know. I, I remember when I was about five years old, I heard of Muddy Waters' record, and I just flipped, you know. And from then on, I was just into it big time, you know. And I think m- maybe promos were influenced. Maybe I heard a, a line of a blues song that I used once in a while, or something like that. But I, it, yeah, I, I know what you mean, and it, it did influence me a little bit. And I did read somewhere on there that you once used a nickname. The Big Kahuna. Well, the Big Kahuna was when I was with WCW, and I was uh, managing the the uh, Fatu, Samu, and uh, and uh, uh, Tah- not Tahitian Prince. Uh, Tonga Kid. Tonga Kid. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. But they were the New Wild Samoans, and I was the Big Kahuna. That was for WCW and probably late '80s, very early '90s. Yeah. Very cool. Well, what do you That and Big Daddy Dink. Now, don't forget Big Daddy Dink. Big Daddy Dink. I, I had to ask you about that. I, I got to be honest with you. I'm going to plead the fifth on this. I honestly don't remember that name at all being used. But uh, what, what was that one about? Well, I was doing kind of a biker gimmick. I was the road manager. Uh, Diamond Dallas Page was a manager, and I was a road manager where I would go out to the different towns with the tag team, Jimmy and Michael, Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin, ah. as the Freebirds. Oh, that's very cool. We had the world tag team title for WCW when I managed them. Very cool. And, uh, yeah, it was a great time. I mean, if you know the Freebirds and know their reputation, uh, they damn near killed me, but it was a lot of fun. Did they ever pee on you? No. Okay, good. I had heard a rumor that if they peed on you, it meant that... <laughs> no, that was the old on. days. I was with Robert Gordy and Michael. They were much wilder then. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> and I want to make a point. That's the first time I've ever guessed a guest if they were peed on before, so... Uh, no, it was it actually was the first time I'd been asked. <laughs> so I can understand. You made that. history. Yeah, how about that? I, another, uh, it's another take I could take off my bucket list thing. There you go. <laughs> All righty. So, what do you hope to uh, accomplish nowadays? I see that there's a Facebook group hoping that you get in the Hall of Fame in 2011. There I'm was, there was on Facebook a guy named Benny Young, a good friend of mine who lives in Montreal. Uh, created a group, uh, Get Humperdinck in the WWE Hall of Fame. Uh, he's got like 
4,000 people signed up. It's very flattering, you know. I don't think it's going to happen. You don't think so? Well, but no, I was there for a cup of coffee, you know. I was there for about a year. Ah. And there's a lot of guys that have been there a lot longer than I had, and I think are more deserving at this particular point, you know. It would be fl- very flattering if it happened, but I just, I don't live thinking it's going to. Ah, okay. How about the actual WWE Hall, uh, the actual Wrestling Hall of Fame? Would you? You know, I had a chance to go up there. I attended their, uh, the one you're talking about in Amsterdam. Amsterdam, New York, that's right. Yes, yes uh, I had a chance to go up there the first part of June when they had their induction ceremonies. In fact, Jimmy Snuka and I you know, inducted Mark Lewin, the maniac, that's right, into yeah. the uh, Wrestling Hall of Fame. And I had a great time. I suggest anybody that hasn't been up there to well, take a run up to Amsterdam, check it out. It's, uh, it's, a, it's in its own building. It's a brick-and-mortar building where you can actually go in, see a bunch of exhibits. and uh, It's really it's very, very entertaining, and if you're a fan of wrestling, uh, you're going to love it. Absolutely. Well, I had a great time up there. I had a, I had a wonderful time. Absolutely. And I mean, I got to say, I've never been there myself, but uh, one of the things that I remember uh, George Steele saying was uh, the question he gets asked all the time is, well, where is this WWE Hall of Fame? And he said, well, it doesn't exist. So th- this is actually a place where wrestling fans, uh, us fans. You can go. Uh, it's open. Uh, it's open like, yeah. uh, I think this time of year, I think it's just open on the weekends. But I mean, you, you can go in there and see uh, 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 like Mola's women's title belt. You know, there's just all sorts of memorabilia. There's all sorts of uh, belts for the belt fan. Yeah, it's uh, different outfits and that pictures. It's a fascinating way to spend an afternoon. Absolutely, it's wrestling's uh, Cooperstown. It's wrestling's Canton. It's yeah, it's right in that area too. Amsterdam and Cooperstown, maybe 80 miles apart. I think. There you right are. in that area, I think there's. Uh, well, I know there's Saratoga where the Racing Hall of Fame is. You got the Wrestling Hall of Fame, then Cooperstown. Is right there too, so you know, make it make a week of it, you know. Very cool, very cool. So, other than the upcoming NWA Legends Fest, is there anything else coming up in the world of Humperdinck? In the world of Humperdinck, well, it's a constantly changing world. Uh, I've got nothing right now that is on the books. Uh, I'm talking to a couple people about doing a couple things, but uh, right now, uh, just concentrating on going to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. August 5th through the 8th to the uh, NWA Legends Fan Fest. If you've never been, guys, and you're a fan of wrestling, come on out, meet us all. I think there's like 30 featured guests. Let me get you some names here. General Skandor Akbar is going to be the, the assassin. Tony Atlas, Joe Blanchard, Tully Blanchard, Ted DiBiase, uh, Bob Carwell, of course, that did the Mid-Atlantic TV for years, Terry Funk, Danny Hodge, Rocky Johnson, Kamala, Sonny King, uh, Nikita Koloff, Harley Race. Uh, I'm bringing the Hollywood Blondes. Have you guys ever heard of the Hollywood Blondes? Yeah, you managed not them Pillman, up in Canada. Not Pillman and uh, uh, my friend uh, Brian, uh, Flying Brian. Yeah. This is before. This is the, the original ones that you managed. The, 70s, the original right? ones that I managed back in the 70s, yeah. Yes, sir. And it's been 34 years since we've all been in the same room. Really? I've seen Jerry over the years, and I've seen Buddy over the years, but I've never seen them together. And Buddy hasn't seen Jerry for like, uh, since like 1977 or 8. So it's going to be a big reunion for us, and uh, we're delighted we're going to be there. And I just invite anybody that's kind of sitting on the fence to come on down, share the weekend with us, and uh, I guarantee you'll have a great time. And anybody Greg Price is a great, great, great host. He's a great guy. And he's going to make sure that everybody has a great time. Absolutely. And you, you forgot one big name that's going to be there, and that is a, a guy that kind of transcends the, the uh, decades, and that is Sting. Sting, yes. Big, the big, oh, wow. big uh, featured guest himself is Sting. He's going to be wearing makeup. You can get a picture taken with Sting. It's going to be a great weekend. I mean, there's something for everybody. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait. To Jim Cornette's going to be there with, the, with the, uh, his booth and all his, his gimmicks and that. And... Uh, Percy Pringle the third, Paul Bearer, yep. Stacy cool. the Cat Carter, who's not bad on the eyes either. No, she was a great. She, her first and I believe only real interview she ever gave to a wrestling radio show was with us. And 
I'm not there sure if that's go. a compliment or, or that we were so rough on her that she he never did another one. But She didn't do another one, did she? No, she didn't, no. You guys must have been pretty tough on her. Ah, uh, no. And let me just mention one more guest that's going to be there. He, he's a guy that's on everybody's mind. Everybody wants to see and meet. He's going to be wrestling on the wrestling show uh, that Greg Price is putting together, and that's Brian Danielson. Yep, and formerly oh, wow. Daniel Bryan. Easy. Yeah, so he's going to be making an appearance, and you can come down and meet him. Get your picture taken with him, and uh, he'll be wrestling that weekend. So he, uh, really got a, uh, he got really handed the uh, short end of the stick on that deal. So yeah, from what I know, uh, you know, it doesn't sound very fair, but uh, he's a tremendously uh, great athlete, and he's going to be all right. All righty. Well, I can't thank you enough, Oliver, and uh, I'll keep keep in touch with you on Facebook. And I want to hear how it turns out. So if you can shoot me a message, and let me know how it turns out with the uh, with the NWA Legends Fest. If you can let us know, we'd really love to hear it. Well, I'll do that. Maybe I'll even call you or give you a, a, a update from uh, Charlotte on Facebook or something. That sounds great. I'll post it on the website anytime we do have a news line on our website. So Yeah, if you want to join the uh, House of Humperdink on Facebook, it's Oliver Humperdink. Just send me a request and I'll, uh, I'll uh, get you in. And you're an equal opportunity oh. friend giver. You know I am. <laughs> well, but thank you so much, sir. It's an honor having you on the show, and uh, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. It's my pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. All right. This has uh, been the future WWE Hall of Famer. I'm going to say it because he will be. The um, legendary Sir Oliver Humperdinck. And all I keep thinking again is every time I hear that name, the first thing that comes to my head is the legendary Gordon Soley saying his name. So, God bless him. He was the best. He was the best. And his, he's got a great um, son-in-law and daughter there, too. They're very nice people. Pam and Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Very wonderful people. I they are them. great people. I enjoyed it, guys. Let's do it again. All right. Take care, sir. Thank you so much. All right, fellas. Take care. Bye. 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 All right. Legendary performer right there, Sir Oliver Humperdinck, one of the original performers at the original Survivor Series broadcast. There's a little tip for you. And, uh, oh, yeah. And it was... Apparently, they're not getting rid of that event. They're not going to get rid of the Survivor Series. Yeah. Yeah, they changed well, their mind. Unfortunately. Well, they, they they probably had a, some sort of an uproar of uh, support telling people not to to do that, not to get rid of it, because it was it's there's one of their few staple events: SummerSlam, Survivor Series, and WrestleMania. Or maybe, maybe they renaming Res- What's that again? Or maybe they just I don't know. Maybe somebody like managed to convince Vince or said, "Okay, well, we'll let Vince say this, and then in a couple months they'll forget all about it." Because apparently. Vince actually doesn't have that good of a memory. <laughs> well, the thing is, you, you know, the reasoning for getting rid of it was that the buy rate was a little low, and, and they have been for the last few years, but my whole belief on that is that, okay, is that the concept that's the problem, or is it the shitty way they handle it? Well, they, uh, the last couple of years, it seems like they built it around somebody's return. One was Cena, one was Edge. It all seemed to be around somebody's return to the ring, and you know that's that's we got to get back to the basics here. One of the things that made the pay per view so great, in addition to the fact that they were different in that you got the the quality matches on the pay per views that you didn't get on TV, which is not the case anymore. Um, now you just get all the matches all the time, and it just kind of seems like overkill. Was that there was basic concepts that you could expect from the pay per views? The first what was it, 87, 88, 89, and 90. I don't remember there being many, if any, matches that dif- that differentiated from the team match concept. None. No, the Hogan Undertaker was the first one. Exactly, and that was, that was a bizarre Survivor Series as a fan, from my perspective, <laughs> for that very reason. Because mm-hmm. it just felt like, whoa, he's defending it at Survivor Series? What's going on here? Because the year prior, they did the whole um, the whole deal where they had the elimination, which was one of my favorites. But a lot of people consider it a throwaway. The uh, Survivor Series 1990. Well, that was, unfortunately, people remember it for the gobbledygooker, which uh, isn't really... Well, they remember it for Undertaker's debut as well, but that was I really like the concept of having all the matches, and then at the end of the show, all the survivors come back and have one last match. I, I, I thought that was a pretty cool idea. It was a cool idea. I mean, and it was something that they, sh- I would like to see again, maybe. Because you got a strange mix of characters. You had Hogan and Warrior, but you also had Tito Santana in there. And that was kind of, 
unfortunately, Tito's stock had kind of fallen by that point to where he wasn't really in that league. But um, but it was cool to see. Right. So. And, and, you know, in this day and age, uh, I, I understand that things, they try to make things seem a little bit more special. Like the early Survivor Series, the team battles, there wasn't really anything on the line. It, uh, it was more about, you know, like the first one was basically all about kind of sort of giving people a Hogan-Andre rematch, but not really because there were eight other guys in the match. But, uh, you know, like when they did the WCW invasion, uh, as horrible as that angle was, they did do the Survivor Series as the final match between the two factions, which I thought was pretty cool. Now it's like, you know, it's a bunch of random people having team battles that don't really mean anything. So, like, yeah, it's like, um, and, and that's been the case for a while. It's not That's not a new problem. Even yeah. if you go back 17 years to 93, it was like, Okay, Razor Ramon on Lex Luger's team with The Undertaker, and they're the All-Americans. And it's like, why, you know, what's the patriotism angle here? Why are they all gathered as part of the All-Americans? You know, what's the what's the impending threat? It just kind of mm-hmm. fell flat to me. Well, probably because at the time they were watching Luger as the top baby face in the company, and his gimmick was being uh, Captain America. Yeah, he, he was Yankee Doodle Dandy, right, yeah. I.e. Hogan Ripoff. Was that, oh, yeah, he was Hogan Ripoff. I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. When he came out and he slammed Yokozuna, that was cool. When they got to the point that he was riding on a bus traveling America, that's when it got lame. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, Ben Benya was on one of the videos. That I was talking about the ben ben you, He was on there. He t- His mother, i got to be tell this story, and Ben's probably going to kill me if he ever hears it. Uh, I, I went in there, and his, his parents, who are the coolest people, by the way, they are very cool people, were actually in the studio at the Blaze. And she's a teacher, so she was grading papers. And the father was actually sitting on the floor. He's just laid back and cool and talking wrestling with me. And he was very cool because he's a nice guy. And because I have, for some reason, a, a, a very strong knowledge of things that happened before my birth, I was able to, you know, keep up with them on things. And yeah. So anyway. Um, she tells me the story that apparently there's there. Not only did he ride on the Lex Express and eventually fall asleep laying there next to Lex Luger, but he also got oh. to do the ring announcing at a, at a WWE event and announce Adam Bomb. I remember that. Oh my God! I think he was was he the kid that said weighing in at two hundred and forty seven libs. <laughs> I, 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 remember, I remember that and I, oh my god I have to ask Ben Benny if that was him <laughs> if it was we have to have him on to talk about it <laughs> <laughs> that's, I got, that's a clip worthy of Botchamania and I, I don't think anybody remembers it but me but I thought it was <laughs> If, if nothing else in this camp, we got to get the audio clip of that. And, and when, if he ever comes on the show, we can play that to introduce him. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, weighing in at... <laughs> play the clip. <laughs> that would be awesome. Oh, I'll have to get Ben to come back on the show. I mean, I know we kind of have him on for special occasions, but maybe we can bring him on again. He's tra- currently trying to sell me his old Nintendo on Facebook right now. So. Oh, cool. I have one, but I have to huff and puff like the effing uh, uh, big bad wolf to try to get my old one to work. I, I use the emulators on my computers because you don't have to blow in them, but I'd honestly rather use the old school controller. Yeah. By the way, you, real quick, friend. Uh, go ahead. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. You asked me first. I was going to ask, do you have a top loader or do you have the original giant box? We have the giant box where you shoved it in the front. Right, yeah. Are you guys talking about like old Nintendo games or NES? Regular NES. Old school. I didn't know they did a top loader. Yeah, they they eventually redesigned it as a top loader. And uh I still have that one. Did that one work better? I don't know if it worked better, but it prob I would imagine less dust got into it. You had to you that that was the one with the, the when the had the front loader, you had to Kind of, if it, you put the game in and it clicked down properly, it worked great. But sometimes you had to kind of crunch it halfway in and halfway out 
uh-huh. where the springs were about to pop to make it actually play. Otherwise, you've got the blinking blue, blinking black, blinking blue, blinking black. It's like, Boy, just work already. I want to play Tetris. Boy, <laughs> this is what we had to go through before they made them all CDs. Yes, I actually joined a Facebook group about two years ago or a year and a half ago or something Said, saying, kids, when I was your age, we had to blow in our video games to make them work. Yeah, now you, now we just have to spray Windex on them. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you one thing. The one thing I hate about the CDs, uh, CD-based games, is I hate waiting for the screens to load. That is the most irritating thing. To me, that was, like, my, I, that was the reason why when when N sixty four came out versus the PlayStation, I went for the N sixty four because even though you weren't getting CD quality audio and all the movie clips that annoyed the piss out of me anyway, the game loaded quick and you could actually play it. Yeah, and the load times have gotten better. But so I wonder if I went back and played PlayStation, how much it would really piss me off. To because I, I know it has gotten better, but ugh. Oh yeah, I mean they're they're aware of that because I mean, they're aware of the load times, and they they've basically now a lot of them are are loading while you're choosing options. Mm-hmm. So they've really improved on that, but still, it's never going to be like our old cartridge day, guys. Nah. Yeah. Anyway, sad times. So speaking of sad times, let's talk some more wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I got to say, Nick, that we're probably going to butt heads in the time coming up here. So yeah. politely, because I we think we're both on the same side in terms of wanting the best for TNA. But I got my sincere concerns uh, as to how they're going to get there or if they're going to get there. Um, the rumor going around the internet now is that Paul Heyman might be brought in with a hell of a lot of power in TNA. Uh, one rumor went as far as to say that he would basically be given control over the entire office. Well, the the rumor basically is that he wants the the rumor is that he wants to come in and be the Dana White of wrestling. For people that don't know, Dana White is not the sole owner of the UFC; he's a partner in it, but essentially his two partners sit back and let him control the whole thing, and that's what he essentially wants. He wants to have pretty much complete control over everyone. It doesn't matter if you're talking Vince Russo. It doesn't matter if you're talking Eric Bischoff. It doesn't matter if you're talking Hulk Hogan or AJ Styles. He wants to be the boss, basically. Well, that that's the report that that's what it's going to take to get him to sign on the dotted line. Is he yeah, worth that Jeff much? Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett's been posting things on his Twitter page and things like that, saying that a big change is coming, and it's not necessarily big news, but just a change and things like that. And, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see what what actually happens. But what I hope you know, the big change is a move to New York. But I think that would be something cool. If they could pick out a little venue in New York to hold impact you know, and maybe even their pay-per-views, I think that would freshen things up tremendously. Yeah, in the early days they did Raw at the Manhattan Center, which was a nice little venue. Um, Very good. That was a cool TNA. venue. Yeah, that was big for TNA standards, but it was a pretty good, pretty small for WWE or for yeah. So I mean, there, there's the Manhattan Center they could use. There's Hammerstein Ballroom, which ECW ran frequently. Yeah. yeah. So those would be very cool things if they can go there. I mean, I, I think infiltrating WWE territory would be a good thing for them because this way they'd see, be viewed as more of a threat. And not only that, though, but being truthful with you, one of the few areas of the country where wrestling still thrives, despite the fact that there's a lot of areas where it doesn't do so well, is that the New York territories and the New York independent promotions are still solid. So that's that's a good place to go. New Yorkers love their wrestling. If nothing else, they can get away from dumb 13-year-olds to try to attack Matt Morgan. <laughs> I read about that. That was hilarious. <laughs> apparently, I, I, I don't know how they're going to cut that out. Well, apparently what happened during the impact taping, they did an angle with uh, Anderson and Matt Morgan. And after the match, Morgan was beating him down and beat him to a bloody pulp to the point that a reshoot was not possible. Well, apparently this, like, 13-year-old kid 
jumped at the ring. It was going to go after Morgan, and then they did a spot where more. I guess it just lucked out perfectly that you know Morgan hit like a big, big clothesline on Anderson, and the kid like freaked out and ran out of the ring. <laughs> And apparently the kid has been banned from future Impact shows. They should leave it. Leave it on there, because that was... Awesome stuff like that was, was, was is, is stuff you'll remember. Like, I remember there was this one time when Hogan was beating up the New Blood with a chair, and some kid came in with a sting mask, and Hogan reared back with a chair and was about to hit him, and I think he saw that the kid was too skinny to actually be a worker. So he stopped mid-chair shot, and all of a sudden, you see Donuts Dillinger come in, rolling over through the bottom ropes and grabbing this kid. So I mean, Hogan almost brained some some unsuspecting child who was wearing a sting mask. You know that happened a lot in WCW, where somebody would jump out over the rail. I remember uh, when the NWO formed, some fat idiot <laughs> jumped the rail to go attack them. I remember. I didn't see it live, but I saw it years later on YouTube uh, when Brian Tillman. Went in, was uh, doing his appearances in ECW, and they did a spot where Douglas was going to hit him, and someone like grabbed a baby. Yeah, I, I remember that. Yeah. How insane do you have to be to do that? Uh, Brian Tillman, insane. That's yeah, insane. I, yeah. I mean, you don't know how much that. That's the thing. To this day, to this day, nobody knows for sure how much of Brian Tillman's loose cannon gimmick was a work. I th- I think I've always said this: genius and crazy are so close that at times they're they're impossible to separate. Truly, I honestly believe it was all work, but he was the only guy crazy enough to work like that. Yeah, I, I believe that. I mean, his WWF stuff. That's the thing. Even though he was kind of watered down slightly with the Hart Foundation, when he was on his own, and when he did anything that was on his own, not as part of standing around the ring while Bret Hart talked, um, he was still the same character. He was a nutcase, and people bought it. Oh, he was the only guy in wrestling that, well, in WWE that I'm aware of that did a gun gimmick. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, and that and was, he was crazy enough to pull that off. If you look at some of the things that that changed history in wrestling. You know, looking back, you could see things like the Survivor Series incident really brought the internet into the wrestling business. But if you want to see where the Attitude Era really got that shot in the arm, that's it right there. I mean, here, I'm, like I said, Tillman was probably the only guy that was insane enough to think, okay, I'm going to pull a gun on national television. I'm going to yell out, where's that motherfucker? You know, on a, at the time, WWE was still, a set, I mean, they were sort of starting on that attitude era, but at the time, I mean, they were not that extreme. I mean, they were intercutting, you know, the Pillman invasion angle with, you know, the Iron Sheik, you know, white meat Shawn Michaels. Yeah. Yeah. Your friendly neighborhood uh, Judas Priest gay man shopping baby face Chippendales dancer, world champion. Yeah, that was him. I never, you know, I always liked Michaels. Uh, like, I've always been a fan of Michaels, but when he was a baby face, I, I didn't get it. Like, <laughs> I was like, uh, the thing that always confused me is after the matches when he would pull his pants down, and I'm just like, dude, I don't want to see your ass. I really, I really don't. Why are you deliberately pulling your pants down? I don't get it. See, that when he was in DX and he was mooning people, it's like, oh, he's an asshole. Okay, I get it. Well, I mean, if you read his book, he clearly did not like it. When Vince told him he was going to turn babyface, like after WrestleMania 11, he was kind of like, what? No, no, no. The people love to hate me. They don't love to love me. And he even kind of like mocked the whole thing. He goes, you know, you know, you have the era where Steve Austin's flipping everyone the bird, and I'm walking around with Jose Lothario looking for feel-good moments. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. true. I mean, he, his character and his look and everything was based on the 80s glam metal scene. And while everybody in the world who knows me should think that I would love that, I was irritated by it. So, uh, I don't know why... But the whole thing just bothered the piss out of me. 
his look was stupid, his his actions were stupid, and his character was so. He was the John. He was John Cena version 1.0. I, I don't think one. he ever got as bad as John Cena, but yeah, I mean, just, for all the as bad as the gimmick may have been, he could still have good matches. Oh, he had phenomenal matches. Yeah, uh, that was I mean, sort of his... that, that's the only thing you couldn't take away from him. The character might have been weak, but you do you do damn well though when he came up on the card that he was going to give you a match worth watching. But anyway, speaking of matches worth watching, or maybe not so much, is uh, Victory Road was this Sunday. Yes, it was. And Patrick, you're right. The uh, the Motor City Machine Guns for the first time have actually won me over. Oh, really? That's a very they, yeah. They, hey, they, they're job boys, but they put on a good match that time. Oh. They put on good matches a lot of times. They're uh, you know I say it all the time. Beer Money is my favorite tag team in. TNA, and I guess by extension, the world, because WWE doesn't really have my... I guess, you know, Ring of Honor has some great tag teams, but um, Beer Money, you know, they're my favorites. Um, but Motor City Machine Guns aren't too far behind them, so... Oh, they're good teams. Yeah, that, that match being as good as it was didn't surprise me one bit. Really? Didn't surprise you? No. Because I didn't, I didn't have high hopes I mean, for that match. Sure. Tag teams, and they've always worked well together, I and mean, they've had a couple matches in the past. I've never heard anyone say, well, that was a bad match. I mean, I... So, uh, it was great. It was nice to see Tina gave that match enough time to let, you know, four guys that really can do a great tag match do it. You know, they, they didn't say, okay, but you only got ten minutes. Well, speaking of that, apparently Tina, you know, realized they struck gold with these two teams, so now they're going to be doing a best-of-five series on Impact. Right. I think part of that may also be the match finish, where if you saw, I think originally did the double pen, where uh, Beer Money scored one pen at the same time that the Guns scored one pen to make justify it, saying, "Well, because there was this controversial finish to the match, we're going to do a best of five series, so you know the best team will truly walk away with the tag team title." And I've always enjoyed the best of series. I mean, everybody, uh, everybody remembers the first best of seven series between Benoit and uh, Booker T. So, I mean, those, those matches. Who's Benoit you uh, speak of? He's the guy who actually I had nightmares about last night. <laughs> <laughs> I had nightmares that for some reason I was traveling, and this is the truth, and I'm not going to lie, and I'm probably going to get made fun of for it for the rest of my life. I had a weird dream that I went to this NWA Legends Fest that was coming up. Okay. And for some reason, even though it's completely in the opposite side of the country, well, at least no, far, far north, for some reason, I was sitting there with Oliver Humperdinck and Jim Cornette, and they looked over at me and said, we should go to Benoit's old house. And I said, why? And they said, we should do some investigation to see if we could find out what the hell really happened. I said, okay, <laughs> fine. So we go to his old house, and we're sitting there looking around at the place, and it's still a mess, and... And, uh... Wait, do you mean... I have Bibles laid out everywhere. Walking up. What's that? Bibles laid out everywhere. Yep. And he comes walking up from the bottom, from the basement. Benoit does. And he comes trying to kill us. <laughs> and it, it, I proceed to start running, and for some reason, my high school, where I went to high school in New Jersey, is near this place where I'm running, and I'm running in and out of classrooms, and he's chasing me around like some scene at a spinal tap. Um, and I keep killing him. Like, he keeps getting run over by a bus. And then I go, like, oh, and then he comes up from the sewer. And he just won't die. I've got, I've got a nice, greatest horror movie ever. What is that? <laughs> he just gave me an idea for the greatest and possibly lamest horror movie ever. Maybe it'll show up on sci-fi soon or something. Huh? <laughs> so, yeah, standard slasher flick and, you know, do it, uh, do it about something offensive and people will talk at least. Now we could have uh, yeah, the, the wrestler that came back. And I'll put you, I'll be cast in like high school and instead of like Oliver Humperdinck, I'll have a, uh, got a, uh, I don't know what what I don't know some other eighty teen girl that is out of work. 
I don't know, like, I was thinking maybe like Jan Hammer or um, who else was there? Who else was around that time that, that hasn't done anything in years? Um, Kim Wilde, the one who did uh, that, that song that, that you two ripped off but nobody seems to want to point out. Yeah. Keep me hanging on. New place called Vertigo. Same song. Sorry, guys. Caught ya. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, Victory Road, um, I don't know, what were your overall thoughts of the pay-per-view? I personally enjoyed it overall. It could have been better, but I thought it was a solid show. I'm actually going to agree with Patrick. It was an enjoyable pay-per-view. Could have been better. I would actually say that the, they put on a best show in terms of the impact before the pay-per-view than they did at the actual pay-per-view. And I know there are, there are some key differences that went on there, and but yeah, I mean, I, it was a good show, but I actually think I was kind of a little bit disappointed because after that impact, I was like, oh my god, that was such a good impact, I can't wait for Sunday, and I was like, yeah, this is a good pay-per-view, but it's like, I was really expecting a little bit more. Maybe I was, too. Maybe I, I was expect- called me while I was watching it today, and uh, my exact comment was, I, I, enjoy, I, I think my exact comment was, I'm not impressed. And while it got better, because the first half of the card was stupid as hell. Especially the uh, the women's title match ending the way it did. I know it's all character and it's meant to get that reaction from you, but it still was stupid. And the Ultimate X match was kind of like, well, what's the point of even having the Ultimate X? Because you've made it so both characters are not going to go for the X, so why even have it? Well, I'm thinking they had more plans for that match, but I think I think legitimately Kendrick Man knocked himself out. On that fall at the end? Apparently. I mean, he was like, he looked out. I mean, like, they actually were using, like, smelling salts to revive him. And I, I know some people think, well, they can rig that. But, it's like, I mean, it, it didn't look like a, a re- like a wrestling selling out. It looked like a guy that legitimately been knocked goofy. Oh, wow. Did you see did it, you wonder? I did. I didn't really think it was a legit injury, though. I thought that was yeah. the planned ending. No, oh, man. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. I'm going to jump off here in a minute. But um, overall, I did enjoy the show. I enjoyed um, Victory Road. But like Nick said, I think Impact was such a strong show that when you left it, you were thinking, hmm, this will probably be a really good pay-per-view. And um, let me let me just uh, dispel rumors and myths and all that that's going on right now. Everybody's trying to, to take the fact that Hogan wasn't there and that Bischoff wasn't there and, and link this to... Oh, they're distancing themselves because they don't want to be involved in the Paul Heyman vehicle and things like that. Okay, if you actually keep up with what these guys are saying, Bischoff said almost a week before Victory Road, okay, I'm not going to be at Victory Road or the TNA TV tapings because of prior obligations. Let the rumors start. He basically (laughs) threw down the gauntlet inviting people to start these kind of rumors, and in the way that the Internet goes, they do. Um, we'll have to wait and see on if they bring in Heyman or if they bring in a new mind. But I'm going to leave you guys with this thought. I mentioned you 2 and I'm going to throw in one of my older favorite bands who I've kind of gone off as years have gone by, and that's Iron Maiden. Vince Russo is kind of like Iron Maiden to me. In his early days, he came up with some pretty inventive stuff that was very cool, changed history, very cool stuff, very, stu- very good stuff that gets remembered. Then he releases some new albums, his new storylines, and they suck. And that's essentially what it is. When you get to be to where you've expended a lot of your creativity in your early years, your later material is never as strong or is never as consistently strong. You can have a great record in between and a great storyline in between, but a lot of times you will have a lot of misses in there. And Russo seems to be firing blanks right now. They're almost all misses. So if Tommy Dreamer's getting more involved in their creative process and considering his injury has no choice to now, uh, if they're going to keep him doing anything, that's probably a good thing. Keep something fresh in there. Keep a fresh perspective. But um, I do think that Russo's ultimate contributions to wrestling have been written and that he's now kind of just releasing uh, shitty new Iron Iron Maiden records. 
I don't know if he'd go this far, but from what I've heard, Russo himself wants to take a break from creative. So it's true. Everybody, including Russo, wants him gone. Hey, is uh, Dan still on the line? I'm here, yeah. yeah. All right. So stop it for a good. second. So, I mean, I, I kind of agree with you. I think I think that he's he's had some good stuff in recent years, but there's never going to be that initial blah spark uh, that he had, you know, when he was, you know, um, young and full of piss and vinegar. Yeah, now he's just full of uh, holy water and something else. <laughs> I find kind of ironic that I called Vince Russo in, like, 1998 young because I think when he took over the WWE uh, – creative, he was still like 35 or whatever, and I'm only 24. Oh, man. I mean, he wasn't turning 29 in a few weeks. Got a little about a month, guys. Aww. 29. That's like the last frontier before I turn like bad. Till I'm the milk that you're not sure if you want to throw away or not, because it's kind of gotten a little cruddy, but you don't know if it's bad. (laughs) <laughs> some people age like fine wine I age like milk oh. alright guys I'll tell you what I'm going to go upstairs and uh, the new episode of Psych is actually uh, we get it on the tape away going to be coming on soon and uh, I love that show anybody who hasn't seen the show a lot of times they throw in a lot of old school wrestling references as kind of comic relief like one time they had a black guy with an afro and they go, look, it's Coco, beware. So <laughs> they, throw in, they throw in the occasional wrestling reference in there. So anybody who likes the uh, these cop dramas that have a little bit of uh, something different to them, there's certainly something to check out. So you just told our audience not to watch us, but go watch Psych and Set. Well, it doesn't well, start until uh, 9 o'clock, my time. And oh, okay. I think it already aired on the East Coast. So Okay, okay. So, being fair. All right, guys, I'm going to run off. I'll let you guys tackle the rest. All righty, James. Bye. All right. All right. All right. So that, was, that was James Walsh, the Lord, Master, uh, Creator of the Wrestling Center dot com. And, Patrick, I guess you and I are left to tackle Victory Road. And Money in the Bank. We have to bring you Money in the Bank. Okay, here's my preview. Mark Henry and two Divas matches. This pay-per-view is going to suck. <laughs> well, we can go cover Victory Road first, but uh, but yeah, I guess we already talked about the Ultimate X match a little bit. Um, I don't want to talk about the three-way because I don't care, and I, I didn't really watch most of it anyway. Um, Knockouts title. Are we all pretty much in agreement that that ending was really stupid? Uh. It- yeah, I mean, I, I did kind of make a joke that no one got. I kept yelling, that's the Stig, the Stig! And uh, for people that don't know, uh, if you ever have heard of a show called Top Gear, they have a character on there who is a mysterious racing driver who they kind of protect the secret of, and I was the only one yelling that, and people I was watching thought I was an idiot. Oh, wow. So, I see, I was thinking, um, you know, I just blanked again. Never mind. <laughs> Forget it. I blanked. But uh, yeah, that was that was a, yeah. And poor Angelina, she always gets attached to these really stupid title changes. Uh, she dropped the title to Cody Deaner, I believe. Uh, yeah. She won the title in that not that uh, lockbox match was, was which was ridiculous. And now she wins the title in this bizarre DQ rule that I don't know. This this was just lame. I, it was like really really lame. Well, um, I, I will give a brief spoiler. Um, he apparently won't be the champion for long. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the, the yeah. argument is that if the, uh, the, the the stipulation is that she would win the title automatically if one of the beautiful people, and I guess Madison proves the uh, Stig is not a member of the beautiful people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was just such a weird ending because it was like, well, and I probably would have accepted it, 
accepted it if the title change didn't end on a DQ. But... It, or, or if the match ended on a DQ but didn't result in a title change and they just DQ'd Madison uh, for having outside interference from somebody else, I probably would have accepted a little bit more, but it just came off really awkwardly. But uh, what was next? Oh, the tag match. That was pretty good. Yes, the tag match, which was... Uh... Stipulation of the match was that if uh, Blair, if Kazarian and Styles win, they got to join Fortune. Of course, they had to beat a mystery team uh, selected by Ric Flair. So essentially, Ric Flair went out and got Godzilla and King Kong, uh, played by Samoa Joe and Rob Terry. Yeah, this was, I actually, you, you know, I, I make it no secret that I'm not too high on Rob Terry at all, but... Um, I think when you have AJ, Kazarian, and Samoa Joe working around you, the match is going to be pretty good no matter who you put in there. And uh, Terry in a spot, he did fine. And, and this was more of an X Division match than the X Division title match was. It was it was a really fun and action-packed and fast-paced match. Right. Well, I think the point that kind of was that with Terry, his big benefit is power moves. I mean, you're not going to have a guy like that go out and do a shooting star press. Or, you know, you know, he does kind of do that jumping spin kick, which was, was kind of cool. But, yeah, that was the point of it where, you know, Kazarian and AJ were going to fly around and be bouncing off these two huge guys. Uh, of course, AJ and Kazarian wind up getting the victory thanks to the interference of uh, Desmond Wolf. So, apparently, they're now in fortune, and uh, they're going to be starting a feud, apparently, with uh, Joe and Wolf and uh, Terry and Fortune. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Uh, speaking of AJ Styles, I wanted to, I did want to throw this out there. Two things for AJ. Number one, um, Impact spoiler, he's going to win the global title on Impact, which I posted this on the forums. That may, that puts him in a class in TNA where he's the only person in history to win the NWA world title, the TNA world title, the NWA tag titles, the TNA tag titles, the X Division title, uh, and then both versions of the mid-card title, which was the Legends title and the Global title. So, um, I don't know what you would call that. That's, that like, Grand Slam champion doesn't <laughs> quite seem to cover it. He's, he's, uh, he's literally won every male belt in TNA. We could call him the Yankee of TNA, or the Dynasty of TNA. Yeah, we can do that. And another thing about AJ, uh, congratulations, he is number one on PWI's Top 500. So, first time that a TNA star has made the list. Hey, well, not well, number one. But uh, first time that a TNA star has ever topped the list. And uh, yeah. I'll say this, they've given it to John Cena twice, so it's about damn time they gave the, well, the much better wrestler the, the award and let AJ win that title, or uh, have that little on. Yeah, it's... Uh, so, so now, PW Insider, you can go. Uh, not, not, no, I'm sorry, not PW Insider, but now, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, you can go back to having an anemic distribution rate where you can't even be distributed in bookstores anymore. See you next year. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, this is better than Triple H being named Superstar of the Decade. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. The, but, but, yeah. First, uh, you know, it's been a while since I've agreed with anything. I, I used to read PW uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated all the time. I, uh, and you know, uh, but I'll tell you what. I, when the minute they gave John, they named John Cena the top wrestler of the year, and they tried to explain their formula, I'm like, shut the fuck up, you idiots! You just you're kissing that. You're kissing Cena's ass. <laughs> <laughs> they, they gave it to him two years in a row, but no, they I, so, either a change happened or they finally came to their senses, or I guess. Because honestly, when you look at the PW inside the the, the, the PW 500. It's basically whoever had the longest world title reign during the, during their quote unquote grading period. So I think it's a lot of it. It's like uh, you know, a lot of it. It seems like very kayfabe, like whoever was the most prominent in storylines that year. Yeah. Like, uh, go ahead. I guess you're right. I guess that would be. I mean, they they claim they have this formula of win loss record, which I'm like, okay, it's pro wrestling. Uh, <laughs> funny drawn, uh, storyline performance, yada yada yada. Basically, the BCS formula. So the, nobody understands it but these people. So finally, I guess the formula worked out for AJ to win it. Yeah. Hey, well, if that's true, if that's the case, then how the hell did Dean Malenko win it that one year? Because that was like 
that that's a strange one. And nothing against Dean Malenko. He's a great, talented guy. But, it's like, how the hell did he win? Because it goes, like, yeah. Bret Hart, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Shawn Michaels, Dean Malenko, Steve Austin. And, and it, it, it's really strange to see Dean Malenko's name on that list. I read that when they, I read, like, an article where they talked, one, one year when they assembled it, and they talked about the process they went through, and they said, 1997 was probably the weirdest year because, in our opinion, no one really stood out. So it was really the year where wrestling skill became the ultimate test, and when we had some of the list, Dean Malenko was number one. Okay. Essentially, I think they're saying we don't know how the hell he got up there, but he did. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, truthfully, if I were going to give it to somebody, I'd have given it to Undertaker in 97, but I think, I think he was I, like two or three. I mean, I love Dean Malenko. I mean, uh, he was one of my favorite wrestlers, but I don't think at any point you would really say he was the number one wrestler in the world. Yeah, exactly. Maybe in terms of hold for hold in ring skill, but you know, that it, when, this, when they claim this formula, or you know, pro wrestling, you can't just say oh, in ring skill. You have to talk charisma, marketability, all this stuff. And with those with those factors so strong for Dean that he would have topped anybody else. Right. But, uh, yeah. So getting back to the pay-per-view, uh, up next was a steel cage match between Matt Morgan and Hernandez. And I'll say this, Hernandez is fucking insane. <laughs> yeah, he wants to break his neck again, doesn't he? Yeah. Well, I mean, he did like a leaping drop kick off the ropes, and then he does a super fly splash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'll say right here, this is a match that's kind of getting ragged on on the internet, and I, I'll be honest, I enjoyed it. I thought it was one of the better matches on the show. All right. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll kind of, I'm a little mixed on that. I kind of understand that maybe people were hoping for, you know, a big bloody bl- uh, battle given the history between these two men, and uh, you know, so I think some people were kind of irritated with the with Morgan. They did a spot where Morgan had a chance to win it, and then he turn back to do more damage. I think that's what kind of what irritates some people, saying, well, that's just stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, whatever. So uh, I thought it was a good match. Uh, you thought it was a good match. And our opinions don't want to count from this line right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought it was just a fun match between two guys who were beating the hell out of each other, and Morgan's uh, overconfidence got the best of it at the end. So, right. Which plays yeah. into a theme we see with Matt Morgan, where he's the most confident guy in the world, and he makes, and it, it, it sometimes leaves him open to these situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, then up next was the match. I believe, Patrick, you were waited with bating breath for. <laughs> Featuring your favorite wrestler in the whole wide world, Jay Lethal, battling my favorite wrestler in the whole wide world, Ric Flair. Okay, now here's the thing. Um, last week on the show, I believe I said... Uh, Worst case scenario, this match is a complete disaster, and Flair goes over. Best case scenario, um, we see the standard formulaic paint by numbers post 2000 Ric Flair match that I have seen about 900,000 times, and, but Lethal goes over. And that's pretty much what we got. There were no surprises in this match unless you were shocked that Flair was still able to, you know, move. Um, but it, it was a Ric Flair match. It, you know, nothing new. Uh, but Lisa went over, and that that was the good move. That was the right call, and I'm glad that <laughs> I, I'm glad that happened. Right. Well, it, it's clear. I mean, they, they if you have if you've been living under a rock, people, uh, TNA is so high on Jay Lethal right now. They're they're trying they're shooting him to the moon, and this is now that that next feather in the cap. You know, he already had the uh, victory over Kurt Angle years ago, and recently he pinned AJ and. Now he's beat Ric Flair. I think that, I think I heard he's working with Hardy at Hard Justice. So if he beats Jeff Hardy, it's like, wow, this guy's really arrived. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I don't know. The, the spoilers are very unclear about that. They said, the spoilers said that he would face Hardy at Hard Justice, but they had a match on the Impact Spoilers. So I don't know if that's just a typo or what the deal on is. On the we'll, show. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, so... Who knows? Maybe there will be like a rematch situation, or um, God, I mean, he could wind up working with Angle, depending on how the uh, rankings are revealed. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
Because I know Samoa Joe and Jeff Hardy had an awesome, apparently from what I'm hearing, they had an awesome match at the spoilers, and that ended in a time limit draw. So uh, maybe they'll do them at the paper. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it turns out. Right, right. Uh, they will be doing something else in the pay-per-view, but we'll, we'll discuss that as the weeks go on and everybody has a chance to see it. Yeah. Uh, then up next was, I, I last match, you would agree with me in this, the match of the night, the TNA World Tag Team Championship match, uh, Beer Money Incorporated versus the Motor City Machine Gun. Oh, without question, this was the best part of the show. This match was um, tag team excellence. From start to finish, I loved it. I loved both teams. I was very happy that the guns went over. Great match. That's part of the show. It was awesome. I mean, there's nothing else to say, really. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing more of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, to me, it reminds me of the old days when you would have that very clear-cut uh, best team, best two teams in the company. Yeah. Uh, Maybe not booking wise, but you know, you knew by in ring talent who the best teams were. The two teams that like got your heart pounding. For example, Heart Foundation and Rockers. Right. You know, whenever they would have a match, you'd be like, "All oh, right, this is going to be cool." That's what these two teams have together. And uh, I think you said it best, Patrick. Uh, the TNA Tag Team Division has been kind of shitty the last couple months, and it's finally over. The 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 rain is gone. We can see clearly now. Oh, absolutely. No more band, no more uh, Nasty Boys, no more Matt Morgan changing his partner every week, no more, uh, hopefully no more Team 3D. <laughs> God, get rid of them. I can't stress that enough. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking at a much brighter future for the tag team division, especially with, uh, you know, I like Ink Inc. as well. Uh, I know a lot of people kind of shit on them. I, I, I think they're decent. Um, and Generation Me is really good as well. And there's more potential for younger teams to come up. And I think TNA's tag division is going to get a lot better now. Right. Well, there's a report that uh, TNA has invited several uh, ROH talents to work dark matches in the coming weeks or coming months. Ooh. And uh, the, t- the two people I think of the most that are probably my two favorite people in ROH, and that is uh, Chris Tiro and Claudio Castanoli, the Kings of Wrestling. If I had a team dream match, it would be Beer Money versus the Kings of Wrestling. Wow, that's that that I'm not gonna lie, that piques my interest a little bit. I think um obviously uh the Kings worked up his heel. And you know, if he really wanted to shoot them to the top and I, I don't and I, the odds of them doing this, I don't think they're the kind of guys that would do this to a company. Uh, would be have them come in with the ROH tag titles, attack the guns, leave the guns bloody, throw the ROH tag titles in the in the trash, and say, "We conquered everywhere else. We're here for the belts to matter." Of course, like yeah, I, they they probably wouldn't do that to Ring of Honor, but that, that, yeah, that would oh. that would be stabbing uh, Kerry Silk and Adam Pierce in the past, literally. And I don't, I personally don't believe that the two guys are. Despite what they play on screen, would legitimately do that to two guys that have been giving them a lot of work over the years. Right. Yeah, so, but it, plus, I mean, that, but that's just me being a fanboy, and that's just me looking out for what's best for TNA. I mean, realistically, if you probably try to do stuff like that, that you'd probably get lawsuits. Yeah. <laughs> All righty, so, uh, yeah, we both love the tag title match, and I'll say it right here. If you will need a reason to go check out Victory Road or if there's anything about it you want to watch, watch the tag match. That was awesome. Right. Then up next was uh, not the match tonight, but certainly a very good match. Uh, the Pope, D'Angelo Gennaro, number eight in the TNA rankings versus uh, Kurt Angle, number ten, as Kurt Angle's quest to top to return to the top of TNA continued. Uh, it's another good match. Um, it's sort of like this. Uh, the main course of this night was the tag title match. The dessert was the Pope, D'Angelo De Nair, uh was the Pope Angle match. It was a very good match, and nice, that's kind of follow-up. Yeah, it was a very good match. It wasn't as good as I thought it might be, but like you said, I think they had a little trouble following the tag match, and that kind of kind of stole their thunder a little bit, but it was still a pretty good match. I enjoyed it. Um, angle won, which I thought was necessary. Uh, 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I just really enjoyed the match, and I hope TNA has a plan for the Pope, because he's somebody that I'm really high on. Um, I won't give away too much, but it does look like they're going to uh, revisit his past a little. Okay. Um, uh, for those who don't know, they're going to uh, basically, if you've been wondering what they're going to do about the Anderson situation with Anderson being the one that extended Pope's time on the show, uh, they'll address it in the upcoming weeks. All right. Sounds cool. So I, think, I guess the question is, Patrick, are you part of the court, uh, are you part of the congregation, or are you an asshole? Oh, man. <laughs> I, I'm on both sides. I mean, there's probably, uh, truth be told, Anderson and Pope are probably my two favorite characters in TNA. So just the idea of them feuding or doing anything together, I, I think, is a really cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, de- definitely. I, I, we were really excited when they were first going to do that, and unfortunately, uh, Pope had gotten hurt at lockdown, mm-hmm. and then uh, I think he kind of, they kind of like realized, okay, he's not going to be back for a while. We might as well write him out. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, unfortunately, Anderson got to be the hottest act in the whole company, so they turned to babyface. <laughs> for now, I mean, I still think he's going to turn heel at some point, like reveal that, hey, I'm an asshole, told you, or something like that, but we'll see. No, that, that, that that's going to have to be the ultimate. At some point, they will. Have, I'm sure that's going to be the line when he turns heel. He's going to be like, I've been telling you I'm an asshole, and here's your off talk when I'm an asshole. Yep. Speaking of that asshole, the, uh, he was one of the challengers for the TNA World Heavyweight Championship. Rob Van Dam uh, defending the title against the best, Anderson and Hardy. Winner and still champion, Rob Van Damn the whole fucking show. Right move. Uh, like I said last week, Rob Van Dam needs to stay champion going into Pound for Glory. So, because they, they need to do that RVD angle match. Uh, other than that, I really don't have much to say about this match. It was alright. It was a standard four way. Everybody just kind of hit their spots. I thought Anderson was cool. Uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. There was a, it was not a very remarkable match, but it was, it was alright. I think what this ultimately was, was, you know, it was just the step to having a one-on-one RVD in a fifth match. Right. Which that will be next month. Yeah. And I, I, I swear to God, I have a feeling somebody is going to take, uh, that, is going to take Abyss as a girl before too long. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I hope they know how to work that thing, because I, I don't like the idea of somebody getting hit with nails. Like, oh. like nails, human flesh. Uh, I mean, go ask Jesus. It's not fun. I don't know what exactly they would do, but they might have to treat it like some guys do with barbed wire, where they're, when you sometimes you see quote-unquote barbed wire in wrestling, it's like tipped or it's been blunted so that it doesn't do as much damage as it actually should. They might uh-huh. have to do something like that. Apparently, if this... Yeah, the impact is... If this did what? Apparently, at this point, we get my mistake of the impact saving. Uh, well, all right. Yeah, so that, that's something else we'll have to see if they edit it out. Cause apparently, he does, like, a spot where he rips up, like, a side of beef or something, uh, you know, to demonstrate how destructive that thing is. And apparently, he hit it so hard, he broke the wood. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Oh, that'll, you know, make for good TV. Yeah, and then they could probably film show, uh, film him constructing a brand new one. You know, yeah, maybe like tattering up art, maybe like painting it up like one of RVD's singlets, to like mock him. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. All right, so that that was Teen A Victory Road. Uh, from that was to play from the Impact Zone, which it may soon to be Goblin Free. Yeah, uh, there's a writer out there that I don't think he's active anymore, but he always referred to Hulk Hogan as a big orange goblin. Oh. <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of that his names off a little. <laughs> kind of the same way when I talk about how great the New England Patriots are, how I'm trying to get your coach. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, we'll see what happens with Hogan. Um, I'm not 100% convinced that Heyman's going to come on board. 
So, I, I, again, we'll just see how it develops over the next couple of weeks. Right. Well, I, I do believe that if Heyman comes in, that's a sign that uh, Dixie or yeah, Dixie probably doesn't want Hogan and Bischoff there anymore. I, we'll, we'll, but again, we'll see. Well, from what I, apparently a lot of people believe Hogan only has a one-year contract. He does have so, a one-year. That's what he said. Yeah. So I mean, realistically, uh, we're in July now. So. He signed in October. I, I don't know technically when the contract went into effect. I mean, you could argue that it wouldn't go into effect until he actually started appearing on their show. So we'll see exactly when it expires. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so that was Victory Road. And this Sunday is uh, Money in the Bank. Goody, goody, gumdrops. Yeah. This, uh, this, this card's got... You see what happens when you cram a lot of people into two matches. Uh, <laughs> this card has a lot of filler on it. Yeah, you're you're going to have to handle this because I cannot get to a computer right now. So you might want to run down the card. Uh, I know the raw made it, the uh, the main event is Sheamus and John Cena in a steel cage match. Except I really don't know why they're going to do that match now because Sheamus went running to Cena like a little boy running for his mommy after a, after some scary man uh, pops out. Well, now, what happened? I didn't see Raw due to a power outage, and I'm actually having Internet problems now, so I'll have to recall the card off the top of my head, which I think I remember most of it, so it won't be a problem. But what happened was, like, they, throughout the night, they had Nexus, um, you know, the main, the main event was going to be six on one, Nexus versus John Cena. Right. And throughout the night, they had got, they had the Nexus, uh, attack guys that were seen as allies, like Morrison, Yoshitatsu, uh, you know, just other baby faces. Well, then, uh, Evan, then finally Evan Bourne. Well, they did a segment where they beat up Bourne, they leave. Seamus kind of comes over and stands over and goes, ah, oh, poor little Evan. He looks up and there's the next gang there and he, he passed, he goes, Cena! Cena! And like he runs by one guy young, where's Cena's locker room? And at the end of Raw, he comes out to help John Cena against the Nexus. Alright. So your go home show, you have the two guys like each other. Okay. Or, yeah, well, like, they're trying to tell with the whole, uh, strange, uh, strange times makes for strange bedfellows, but it's like, you've already done that, and last week you did a whole segment where Seamus and everybody came out, all the heels come out and said, you know what, Cena, we don't care. Because the Nexus just beats you up. Yeah. So it's like you're kind of going back and forth. Uh, I expect a typical John Cena, Seamus match. You've seen them one, you've seen them all. I, I haven't seen any of them, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> um, I think Cena's going to win. I, I, uh, because it will probably, Hell, it might be Cena versus Wade Barrett at SummerSlam for the belt. I don't know, but uh, I I don't see Sheamus losing, or I don't see Sheamus winning this match. I, I just think the belt's going to go right back to Cena. That's just how I feel. I, I could be wrong, and they could continue Sheamus's reputation as like the one guy that Cena can't beat. But I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll see. Well, one thing they keep teasing is uh, that 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 night, one of the Money in the Bank winners could catch in. They keep hinting it with the Raw main event because it's in a cage, and the idea is a cage match would be so brutal that even if you go through a Money in the Bank match early in the night, if you run out after a cage match, the guy's going to be easy picking. Uh Uh-huh. And apparently the WWE wants to cash in one of these contracts sooner than later, so that way they don't have two guys running around with briefcases. Right. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they did that. I think if they're going to do that to any of them, they, they'll probably do it to the SmackDown match, though. Because, well, I mean, I, I don't know, because the SmackDown match is so, uh, uh unimportant. Me. Yeah, unimportant. It it feels like, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's Swagger versus Mysterio, and these are, Swagger's a guy that they've shit on, basically, so why should I care? Yeah, it, it's basically two of the worst world champions, two of the most poorly booked, uh, two champions that were both jobbers, uh, battling it out for the title. Yeah. So, uh, whatever. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I pretty much like who's going to win. I guess I, I keep hearing that Swagger's going to win the belt back because apparently they have him lined up for house shows making title defenses, and I'm thinking, really? R- really? <laughs> like, didn't you already fail with him once? I, I, I don't know. Here's the thing. If they would book Swagger to win matches and not and have him, you know, here's a guy that's about 6'6", I want to say 250 pounds, Pretty, uh, you know, football player style guy. You, if you would book him as a guy that can win matches, he has the potential to be a pretty good heel champion. The problem is now you have to rebuild him because you've already blown one opportunity with him as world champion. You've already had him be a jobber world champion, so now you've got to do twice the work with him. He was a jobber before he won the world title. Yeah, I'm, I mean, he was he was lowest to the low on the card. Right. Here's the thing, if they would have, you know, had him win the belt and then he goes on a winning streak and, you know, he's pinning everybody, you know, he's, you know, nobody can stop him. Hey, he could have shown that, wow, you know, this guy's had a huge turnaround. Now he's just continued to be a world champion. He's basically been portrayed as a guy that had the belt but only got it because he had the money in the bank for you. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, those are two world title matches. I guess, do you want to go into the, God, what else is on this card? Um, the tag title match, Heart Dynasty versus the Usos. I have never seen the Usos work, so I can't tell if this is a good match or not. Here's my prediction for this match. The Usos are going to win, are, are going to be about to win. When out of nowhere, Dog the Bounty Hunter runs in and arrests Tamina for jumping bail. Because I swear to <laughs> God, she looks like every, if, when there's ever there's a woman on Dog the Bounty Hunter that they call her, Tamina looks just like them all. Wow. Now, some people might think that's really cruel. I say you don't know me very well. That's one of the nicest things I've ever said about an employee of the WWE. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, uh, I, I again, I don't really know any much about this match. I know they've been feuding, but okay. I've, I've never seen the Usos work, so I have no idea if this is a match that I would enjoy or not. I mean... I saw them work a little bit on Monday. Uh, they're okay, but to me it just seems like a typical WWE formula with the tag belt. Team comes in, team debuts, they get shot right to the top of the tag team division. No real rhyme or reason other than the fact they're new and the champions haven't beat them yet, so they're the only ones left. All right. Well, you still got, what's that new team, uh, Vance Archer and Kurt Hawkins? Yeah. But uh, I was like, wow, that's a tag team. Wow. Great. Well, uh, God, who, somebody on Twitter, I want to, I want to say, uh, Sean Devari, formerly Sheik Bashir, wrote on his Twitter, quote, Vance Archer looks like a really tall Chris Saban. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw a picture of Vance Archer and how, what his look is now. He does look just like a really tall Chris Saban. Oh, wow. Same, same hair, same height, basically. Ooh. So I, I'm assuming he went to the Michelle McCool School of WWE Superstardom, which is still ideas from TNA. Well, uh, Vance Archer worked with TNA, so he was Lance Hoyt. So he probably he knew Saban personally. Yeah. Probably worked with him. I don't remember, but... Yeah, well, that, that's just it. Uh, I don't know about the tag match. Uh, I think it will be a big question mark. I guess it's a question of how good are the use goes really and how much time they'll get. And as for prediction, I'll just pick, I'll pick the Usos to win because, like I said, it's the WWE formula. New team debuts, new team wins belt. Uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, then we've got the two women's matches. We have a women's title match between <laughs> Layla and Michelle, or not Michelle, but Kelly Kelly, and a match between Alicia Fox and Eve Torres. <laughs> now, real quick, I, I'm sorry, I just came back in for one second oh. here, guys. Hi, buddy. How you doing? How you doing? Um, you got two girls who put on one of the better matches of last month's pay-per-view. In whatever Snooker's daughter's name is, and Natalia. And they're not working in one of the women's title matches this 
on, on this one? I, I don't understand the, the logic in that. The good women workers in WWE become valets. And the ugly, not, and the ones who well, can't work become wrestlers. Go, <laughs> I don't get well, it. Well, James, Tamina probably can't work because he's going to be on the run from Dog the Bounty Hunter. Who's that? Tamina probably won't be at the pay-per-view because she's probably going to have to be running away from Dog the Bounty Hunter. What did the dog, the big bad dog, have to do with her? What happened there? Um, it's a joke I'm making because I've been watching a lot of Dog the Bounty Hunter recently. And every time uh, there's a woman he has to go arrest, I swear to God, it looks like Tamina. Is it the Hawaiian, the Fiji, Samoan thing that they got going down there in the Hawaii, or? Well, that, and she just kind of looks like a drug addict. <laughs> kind of looks like her dad, so it fits. She's Jimmy Snooker's daughter. He threw a woman from the balcony of his hotel room for crying out loud and got away with it. Oh, my he God. He killed a girl. <laughs> Didn't he kill a girl? You know, she jumped, apparently, but there, that's just... There you go. No, I heard. Jump back. All right, bye. I think that would be the greatest episode of Dog ever. If Dog had to go arrest Jimmy Snuka, and then they were like in the back of the SUV and they started talking about what happened with the girl in the hotel, bro. You know, man, you, you got to turn around your life. You know, it's never too late. You know, the same standard speech Dog does with every one of the convicts on that show. Yeah. Wow, well, that's, that's funny. Yeah, so yeah, so we have two women's title matches, which means double the crap, double the comfort. Uh, does it? Re- I mean, does it really matter? I mean, they're filler matches. They're filler matches. They're on here. The, both those matches are on here because they've crammed sixteen people into the Money in the Bank matches, and they've got nothing left, and they have time to fill. So that, that's why we've got these matches. And uh, right, wow. I, if, again, who wins? I. Don't care. I really don't care who wins either of these matches. Well, here, here's what I think is going to happen. I think that Kelly will, uh, Bimbo Bimbo, will win the women's title, but then because they're doing this whole stupid co-champion thing on SmackDown, Michelle will go, well, she's not really champion because she didn't beat both. And then Michelle, then uh, Bimbo Bimbo and Undertaker's wife will have a match. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, as for Eve and Alicia, who gives a rat's ass? It's going to suck. And if you're looking for a good match here, you're a fucking idiot. Learn what the hell wrestling is about and learn what a good match means. And then you'll know why you should hate Alicia Fox and Eve Torres. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, we've got two more matches, and these are actually the big attractions on the pay-per-view, aptly named Money in the Bank. Two Money in the Bank ladder matches, one from Raw, one from SmackDown. Now, again, I don't have access to the Internet, so I'll just pull this from memory. The SmackDown match, I believe, will have Cody Rhodes, um, Dolph Ziggler, um, Kofi Kingston, Drew McIntyre, who I think is going to win, uh, Christian, Matt Hardy, and, oh, I'm drawing a blank, Kane, yeah, how the hell is Kane getting in there? And there's one more, and I'm going to hate myself when I hear it. Big Show. Big Show, yeah, there we go. God, how the, he doesn't need a ladder. He can just reach up. God, he can cheat. Yeah, so um, I, I, I'm going to pray McIntyre wins, because if he doesn't, that means Big Show or Kane wins. <laughs> Oh, my God. Um, personally, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to pick McIntyre to win. But I think if I had to pick a number two, and maybe I'm just setting myself up <laughs> for disappointment again, but I think Christian is probably the second most likely to win it. We'll, we'll see if they actually pull the trigger on Christian. Why do you do this to yourself? You hope, I'm, hope, and you hope. <laughs> I'm going to do something significant with Christian. And then every month after Christian does nothing significant, we get back to this point, and he wants to can't they're going to do something significant, and you just are going to disappoint yourself again. Yeah. You're, you're, you're like 
father with his ex-girlfriend. He's not ah. going happen. Give it up. All righty, all righty. Uh, Dolph Ziggler is another one. Uh, I, see, I would have wanted him to win it, but since he's paired with Vicky Guerrero, Guerrero, if he wins, that just means more TV time for her, so I don't want him to win. Well, I, what I honestly think is going to happen is I think Kane's going to win, Swagger's going to regain the world title, and that will be your SummerSlam main event. Oh, God. <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> that would be absolutely terrible. I think, and I'll, I'll make a prediction here. I think one of the guys, uh, don't know which one, whoever wins Money in the Bank, I think one of them is going to save it for Mania. Uh, well, we'll see. Uh, I, 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 if it's someone like Orton or Edge, I could see that happening on the Raw side. But uh, speaking of which, there is a Raw Money in the ladder, uh, Money in the Bank ladder match, which, you know, you really could have gotten away with just doing one on this pay-per-view, had four guys from each card, and then... You don't have to put two Divas matches on this card. Yeah. Yeah, that that probably would have been better, actually. But, um, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, anyway, the Royal Money in the Bank will include Randy Orton, Edge, Ted DiBiase, uh, la, 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 Evan Bourne. Mark Henry. Uh, Mark Henry, yeah, Mark Henry. Yeah, like, our truth had to pull out due to injury, and I was like, oh, well, I'm not going to miss him. And it's like, oh, they just replaced him with Mark Henry. It's like, God damn it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Mark Henry, John Morrison, The Miz, and one more young guy. Uh, said Evan Bourne, didn't I? Yeah, you said Evan Bourne. Okay. We're showing uh, how exposed we are when we don't have the internet, folks. Yeah, this is. I, I have internet problems. I can't lo- link onto the internet. I'm sorry. God, this is going to piss me off. And I'm driving to work, so I don't have a computer with me. And if I could, it probably wouldn't be such a good idea for me to be surfing the net right now. Oh, no, not at all. Not at <laughs> all. I think I'm technically violating a lot because I have my cell phone out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's nice to know that you're willing to sacrifice your well-being and the law, you know, just to, just to help us out with the show. I really do appreciate that, Nick. But uh, prediction for the raw money in the bank, if it's going to be a young star, like, somebody new that they want to build up, it's going to be The Miz. And if it's going to go to an established star, it's going to be Randy Orton. I think they might give it to him. I agree. Uh, Chris Jericho, that's who it is. Chris Jericho, that's who I forgot. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to predict it's going to be Orton, because I think they... Because if you notice, like, they've been doing a couple of brawls where, you know, the all, where a couple of the Money Bank guys get involved, and he always comes out on top. I mean, this past Monday, they had a Mark K.O. Evan Bourne out of the Shooting Star Press. That must have looked amazing. Uh, they tried to sell it like it looked amazing. To me, it just kind of looked like Orton jumped up. <laughs> Uh, that, that sounds like pretty awesome. I'd like to look up a clip of that once my internet starts working. But uh, yeah, that's money in the bank. Um, my thing is the meat and potatoes of this pay per view is going to be the money in the bank ladder matches. They're going to be car wrecks, and you're going to get two title contenders out of it. So I mean, if that intrigues you, uh, check it out. Um, no, but that's pretty much it. I mean, that's uh, the money in the banks are the only real thing about the show that really have any interest for me. Yeah, well, it it's basically a two-match pay-per-view. Uh, maybe three if you're a John Cena or a Simmons fan. But, no, I mean, the, the, this is just you know, what we've been getting the last couple months from WWE, where it's a pay-per-view padded to hell. You know, it's, there's stuff on there that makes sense, and then there's stuff on there where you're like, why? You know, yeah. well, Two Divas matches. I mean, realistically, if, if somebody's out there in uh, Internet Radio Land and you're honestly looking forward to two Divas matches, email me and let me know. Because I'd like to, because I honestly cannot believe any uh, the majority of wrestling fans are out there saying, "Yay, Kelly Kelly gets a match." <laughs> I'm not. I'm like, I, and I knew they were going to do this too. I. Uh, 
I knew it's like, because they had so many people crammed into the Money in the Bank matches, I'm like, oh, man, we're going to get two women's matches, aren't we, out of this. And they picked, like, the worst possible girls <laughs> to do it. And it's like, oh, God, why? But, um, Smackdown. you know, I was hoping... Uh, go ahead. Well, on Smackdown, who really... Who the hell else is left? I mean, Beth's injured. Melina's injured. Uh, Mickey James is, is is gone. I mean, they were the three on SmackDown that had talent, and they're 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 not there. So I mean, it's like there's nobody else on SmackDown. Unfortunately, arguably Kelly Kelly is on SmackDown right now. I think Michelle McCool's probably the best. I know you don't like to hear that, but I well, I mean, she's not good, but compared to all the other girls on SmackDown, she's the best. You know, like I said before, like, when she was the top girl on SmackDown, you had girls like Natalia and, and, you know, whoever else was there at the time. But they were there. I was like, you can't justify her being the top girl if, you know, all those girls are there. It's like, there's no justification for it. Now, she is the most talented girl, and she's not the champion. She's kind of a bullshit co-champion, but uh, she's... <laughs> okay, whatever. So what you're saying is that Michelle McCool is Tony Kukoc. What? Where she was, uh, if you don't know, Tony Kukoc was on the uh, last three uh, Chicago Bulls championship teams with Rodman, uh, Jordan Tippin, and Steve Kerr and a couple guys, and Ron Harper, and he got a lot of minutes. He was never, like, the, the top guy on the team. Then when they all left, he kind of became the best player on the Bulls. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, well, actually, you know what? I apologize to anyone that's a fan of Tony Kukoc because I just insulted a pretty good basketball player. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. So the best, best Eve on SmackDown, like, the best baseball player on the Pittsburgh Pirates. Hmm. But, yeah, congratulations. You're the best because nobody else that was talented on that team. I mean, they. Uh, we've talked about this on the show every week. They've just they've taken all the piss out of SmackDown. There's nothing going on over there that's even yep. remotely interesting. Yeah. So um, I should get going because I got to clock in at work and get money and pay off the expensive piece of workout equipment I just bought yesterday. Oh, cool. All righty. Well, I've got nothing else to say. So for Nick Knoll, I am Patrick Kelly. Thank you to James Walsh for coming on with Thank us and hosting the show. Mr. Kelly. <laughs> so, apparently, James is the line. Um, apparently James is eavesdropping on us but that's cool it's his show he can do whatever the hell he wants um, oh it's our show thank you. I, just, I just came by at the end oh yeah Whew. awesome well I'm a bit of a narcissist I'm actually my new laptop it has a webcam on it and I'm watching myself talk on the phone so either I'm really bored or I, I, like I said I'm a narcissist but uh yeah, thank you to James, thank you to Nick, thank you to Oliver Humperdinck for being our guest, and thank you all for listening. How many people learned me. the meaning of the word narcissist from Lex Luger's gimmick? Me. <laughs> that was me. Okay, guys. Enjoy, everybody, and uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks to Oliver Humperdinck and Patrick. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good night, everybody. Have a great week. Enjoy the pay-per-view, and we'll see you next week here on the Interactive Interview on WrestlingAtTheCenter.com.